A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 177th episode of Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. Just over two years ago, when the pandemic had just set in and schools had closed down, we at Notebook felt it was our duty to set up a platform for educators to connect meaningfully on, discussing problems they were facing with the rising need of digital education and online learning and arrive at common solutions. Today, 177 episodes later, this platform has grown much bigger than we could have ever anticipated, all thanks to your love and support. We have discussed extremely curricular topics here like digital learning, NEP and assessments, extracurricular topics like sports, theater, topics like school finance and management, and even evolved topics like mental health. Today, we go back to the very root of schooling, the formative years. The formative years are the early stages of childhood uh, if you do a Google search, are between zero to eight years of a child's life, where they learn more quickly than any other time in their lives. This is the time when they're most impressionable. And this is the foundation stages. This is crucial in deciding what kind of a person this child will grow up to be. Also, this is a stage where in the beginning, there's a lot of the parental influence, the parental, uh, the parents control every single influence that comes to the child. And then as the child starts going to school, the school takes over, the teacher starts influencing and our education system starts leaving its first marks. So in a way, this is where, you know, nature kind of blends into nurture, deciding how this child will shape up. Well, to speak about this, we have our eminent experts today. The first speaker on this topic today is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as a deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in school education. Mr. Barrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000. Incidentally, right now he's the father to a child who's in the formative years. So sir, we are hoping to hear from you not only in your professional capacity, but also in your personal capacity. Sir is also our senior advisor and we at Notebook are privileged to have him with us. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Bayo. Can I, am I, am I visible and audible? Perfectly, sir. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, you were right. I, not only do I have um, a young yeah, daughter, daughter. Um, uh, of 11, but I have two grandchildren. And even though I have um, taught secondary school students all my life as a teacher, um, my only interaction with uh, the formative year group, as you said, from zero to eight, is my own children and my grandchildren now. And I spend so much time just watching them play and explore their world, asking questions, moving from one activity to the other in quick succession. So the swing, the ball, the trampoline, getting them to read the story or getting them to be told a story, all in the space of 30 minutes. It's not only tiring, but it's, in, it, it's, in, it, it's, it's, it's increasingly interesting for me, who's never taught this age group. And what I have learned is that uh, you know, all a child needs is running water, still water too, uh, sand, um, wooden blocks, a rope that dangles from a tree, maybe a rubber tire at the end, end of it, caring caregivers, mother, father, people around them who are present. And, and the word present is important. It's not just being sitting there with your cell phone and a book in your hand. Present is actually present with your heart, with your eyes watching everything. That's all a child needs. He doesn't need Hamley toys. He doesn't need, uh, um, you know, these modern uh, gadgets. Obviously, I, I mean, Lego is great. I think Lego is something that uh, I never had as a kid, but we, but we had mechano sets. We had a uh, little older when you actually had to tighten nuts and screws. That was fantastic. So as you said the earlier, Sabayu, um, zero to eight is the formative years and very important for the physical, emotional, intellectual development of a child. And in a, in a way, this is also, it has a bearing on what the child does much later. Um, this is the time when uh, a child, I think, learns the quickest 
uh, and the graph of learning is you know the steepest and after that it just sort of settles down and we've heard the age old adage that you know uh, we shouldn't let school interfere with our learning with our education and the graph settles down and actually up to you know what 14 and then it steadies out and instead of going up as we get older it flattens out onto a plateau so as a young person these nerve synapses are being made very very rapidly they learn they very very fast and during the first years the brain is most flexible uh, so flexible that uh, uh, you know most learning takes place here some of the concepts of course come later but learning as the brain develops in size and weight uh, is the, is the most rapid here the brain is literally like a sponge it will absorb anything in the environment any interactive uh, uh, you know opportunities any any stimulus new sounds um new relationships new experiences i was told that children are only scared of three things uh, large objects uh, loud noise and heights otherwise children are not scared of anything children are, can have, have been playing with uh, you know they play with black rubber snakes even uh, you know as soon as they're born uh, in the first year fear is something that we put into them um so first of all it's it's a very rapidly learning uh, stage now i think children learn through observation through play and experimentation and the only support that we need to give them is as i said earlier we need to be present with them a lot of us adults we keep our children in this in this time you know with with uh, domestic help with with people who you know who are paid to take care of them and very often they don't do the job that they um and, and why should they they're not the real caregivers they are people who come in and look after and clean the house but uh, this is where i think children are neglected um the most beneficial learning and development process for a preschooler is play and often you know they don't realize that it is play it, it is to play that they learn everything they contact their environment through play they explore they want to touch they want to taste they want to put things in their mouths that's why you need to be around and um, you know they they experiment through taste sound and everything um, a great deal happens when kids are just playing uh, they are developing habits attitudes skills which stay with them through their lives and as they play they they voice they make sounds uh, they cope with frustrations when they can't get something into a socket um and just like kids don't need to learn how to play just like eating swallowing crawling they they grow into it they they it comes naturally uh they also learn to sing listen interact observe these these are the very very important contributors that preschoolers get um i think that uh you know what children need here is not as i said ready made toys they need things like cereal boxes they want to see street signs logos on billboards they want to color paint write scribble draw tear cut um they want to uh, play with you know these um, bubble bubble uh, wrap they want to smash bubble wrap they make the sound um this is what i think children need to do um, they want to sing they want to act they want to copy they want to imitate what they see on television uh they want to imitate their their parents uh, voices and their facial expressions and i think a, a child learns that if he is loved um through appropriate attention opportunities and stimulation provided by the parents and guardians they learn to trust uh when they know that their teacher will be there if they fall if they know that their mother will be there when they return home this is what gives them that early start in life the trust the confidence they start learning to understand their own needs their thoughts their feelings their likes their dislikes they spend time playing and interacting with teachers with other children this they learn how to communicate think problem solve simple problem solving parents keep asking me what is the right age that you know to send their children to school and of course i always say 5 i don't think they should ever get to school before 5 but the nep has even suggested that 3 is a good time to start and i think there are a lot of these little hole in the wall nurseries and preschool and play classes that have come up 
I, I don't believe in that personally. I think it's just a money-making gimmickry. Um, I think parents are afraid that if they don't send their children to school very early, they may fall back vis-a-vis uh, -vis other children and they will find it hard to catch up, which I think is, again, totally um, a, a misnomer. Children catch up very fast. Even if you don't send a kid to school till seven, the catching up rate is so fast that they won't be, one will not be able to find any difference. In, in six months, they've got up. Children learn more at home, um, whereby care, parents and caregivers uh, teach them the basics of life, pronunciation of letters, the, you know, using sticks and stones they can count, listening to stories, they create imagination, their characters, they want to hear certain characters. I uh, invented a, a, a fictitious character uh, because I had run through all the book stories that were available to me. So I created a fictitious character for my children called Smart Alec. And they loved this character. It was a character out of my imagination who was a rather fat boy who always got into trouble in class. And uh, they just loved it because, uh, and then when I got a new book for them, they said, no, I want, we want to hear Smart Alec. Um, and why are the formative years, I think, important is that uh, there is cognitive development. That the first thing is cognitive development which again includes skills like solving, asking questions, visual discrimination, matching and comparing, sorting, organizing, understanding fact from fiction, um, uh, you know, the effect in, of simple reasoning. Um, they also learn social skills, social and emotional development, uh, expressing various emotions, communicating, uh, developing friendships with other children, sharing their toys, learning to put away their toys, um, learning to um, uh, get along with their siblings. Um, I even learned uh, that children can save money at, at this age. They put away some coins for, uh, for something that they want later on. Then there is speech and language development, you know, which comes through reading. When, when children hear their parents read, they know how to, they, they get the phonetics of words, how to communicate through basic, um, you know, uh, signs or languages. Um, stories are very important uh, because stories teach children how to describe things, adding to detail, how to speak audibly, uh, how to speak in complete sentences. Then, of course, there's the fine motor skills, which, the, you know, which I mentioned, like eating, brushing your teeth, uh, holding a spoon, um, uh, combing one's hair, uh, molding the clay, cutting, sticking. Children love love to use their hands. You know, my kid, uh, I think I have bought kilos and kilos of Play-Doh and this very, very um, awful substance called uh, slime. They just love it. They love the different textures, you know, from velvet to sandpaper to slime. They just love uh, the, the feel of different textures. Uh, there's also gross motor skills, which they learn through uh, balance, muscular coordination, uh, kicking, jumping, uh, throwing, climbing, uh, opening doors. These are very important skills that we pick up in the formative years. Um, uh, also, we, we, we shouldn't rush children into skills that they're not ready for. You can't expect a five-year-old to catch a ball, matter how light the ball is. They just haven't developed the eye-hand coordination for that. Um, so I think it's important that parents and caregivers also know what to expect from a child. Um, very often when a child sees a father comb his hair and if the father's parting is on the left, to a child it appears on the right because he doesn't understand what is left or right. So he gets mixed up with what is right and left and sometimes he combs it the other way. In this, a lot of parents uh, want to change a naturally left-handed child to being right-handed, which I think is wrong. If a child is naturally left-handed, like my granddaughter is, I think they should allow them to be left-handed. Uh, it causes a great lot of confusion, mental confusion, if you switch brain sides, uh, because people generally feel that being left-handed uh, is wrong. Um, so I think that uh, the formative years are important. Um, when, you, when a child comes to school at five, not all kids are alike. There is a vast difference, a gulf of difference between them in terms of physical, emotional, intellectual development, which only goes to show 
that some kids have a better start to life than others. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Shubayu, I'm not very good at this age group. Uh, I'm interested in it. I look forward to hearing from Achin and our experts. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for giving us this brilliant start. Uh, you might say that you're not an expert in this group, but sir, we all just heard to the contrary. And also, sir, if ever Smart Alec were to become a character in a fiction series, we at Notebook would be very interested in taking that forward. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after Mr. Barrett, it is time for our next speaker, Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Ochin is a fellow of the ICAI and a member of CPA Australia, CPA Ireland, and a member of CIMA UK. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. An avid reader and a passionate traveler, Ochin has keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Unfortunately, due to a personal emergency, Ochin could not be here during this session. However, given how important Together for Education is to all of us here at Notebook, he has recorded his uh, message on this topic, which I'll play for all of you now. Good evening, everyone. I once again welcome all of you to today's session. Today, we have one of the most pertinent topics, which is of relevance, not only in our schools, but in our society at large. There's a certain point in our lives when we stand at the crossroad of childhood and youth. Suddenly, old pastime and interests seem juvenile. But the application for entry into the big boys or ladies club is still pending approval. Yes, we are discussing about that important juncture of life where we all rediscover ourselves each day. These are years when we don't need wings to fly. Change and excitement are in the air. When we found ourselves misfit in parties as we were too old to join kids for playing in the terrace and too young to join the men in the bar. However, the best part of the entire experience is that children are happy sometimes for reasons which are even unknown to them. Very often, they're so happy from within that their present worries do not affect them as they're busy weaving dreams for future. However, this phase also ensures that there's a seismic shift in approach towards life. And also with regard to the inner circle, which act as sounding board. Although parents and teachers are still important as, as role models. In this phase, teenagers often prefer to confide, to share in their peer group. In their peer group, because as the grown-ups may at times fail to look at things from their perspective. Thus, it is very important to, to ensure that they get mature and sensible advice, guidance, in this particular phase. Standing at any crossroad is always confusing. We would all agree. And on top of it, if there are no clear road signs, it only makes things worse. Now, the other thing with regard to this particular phase, when we discuss about formative years, teenage, I think the whole concept of peer-to-peer -peer comparison, which is so apparent in this particular phase. As each child goes through puberty at their own pace, so any peer-level comparison may result in uh, confusion, uh, self-doubt, and consequential depression. Now, most of the time, and very often we see this, that biological maturity precedes psychosocial maturity. Thus, when a teenager 
starts to struggle for independence and control, many changes may happen. Some, some very common issues that, that generally affect children during these years, I think first and foremost, uh, they want more independence from their parents, which is always the case, most often the case. Second, a peer influence and acceptance in the peer group becomes most important criteria. So they behave as if the entire existence depends on it. Acceptance in, in, in the coveted peer group. And also at times romantic relationships become important. No, if you look at things from, a, from an educator's perspective, the task of teaching teenagers, of course, very challenging with so many esteemed educators in this forum. And considering the fact that we have uh, esteemed panelists with decades of experience. I'm sure, sure they're they going to share their own unique perspective on this. But just generally, if I take a more holistic view, we all agree that teachers are often, uh, uh, you know, the, the way, as far as educators are concerned, they deal with this uh, day in and day out. And there are multiple challenges that teenagers pose at this particular phase. I think some things which really help is and I'm sure that educators in this forum would agree with me. First and foremost, building that trust, confidence, rapport with them, which is essential for success to ensure that acceptability increase. Because if we don't, they will probably complain about everything and anything. A genuine interest in them and their lives will really improve our relationship with them. And we've all seen this, that children, they have a very special talent for seeing through us and knowing if we are being genuine or faking this particular interest. So they understand who is genuinely interested. Second, of course, is knowing their interest. Now, taking time out to, good, to get to know them more and use that knowledge in the planning phase. So things like, say, for example, an online survey at the beginning of, of the year, uh, individual interaction, knowing the kind of activities uh, they prefer, be it uh, listening to music, watching movies, maybe short videos. And, and again, interest varies from group to group. Other important aspect is to, to ensure that our children feel that they're in command to give them choice in terms of classroom activities, maybe in terms of type of task, of the kind of tool we propose to use, the ways to present it, among others. The other aspect is that I think variety is very important because in this particular phase, teens, they get bored very easily. And you'd all agree with it. So we can change, if we can change the order in which we normally do things and come up with uh, unexpected original tasks to break down the classroom routine, the monotony. So I think that that really works. Other aspect is now continuously, continuously, uh, throwing a challenge at them. Maybe, maybe an unique way of presenting something, asking them to come up with, uh, to share their own perspectives, to moderate and initiate peer-to-peer -peer discussions. So I think any kind of open-ended task where their, their creativity comes in, the fact that they, they feel that they're in command, they feel the fact that they need to bring out their best, so I think these are a few things. The other is uh, when we discuss about formative years, I think no discussion in this topic would be complete without discussing the role of parents in this. The fact that children need their parents so much in this particular phase. As we all agree that adolescence can actually be a very difficult time if not handled properly. Children are going through, through, through physical changes, emotional ups and downs. And at times in this particular phase, they're not very sure where they fit. They're still trying to work it out. Now, again, in this particular phase, peer influences and relationship can actually cause stress. And it is important to, to handhold a child, important to at least ensure that the child knows that we are there for them to see them through this phase. Now, a few things which are like very uh, simple things, which, which I think helps a lot, which families can do to ensure they give that kind of comfort to children. I think family meals, 
a chance where everyone can uh, chat about their day something interesting sharing something interesting and of course if we can keep our uh, mobile phones away from the dinner table or maybe switch off the tv it really works wonders family outings again so important fun time choosing activities which as a group the entire family can enjoy together ensuring that everybody is taken along we can get away etc the other aspect is one on one time with with children which gives parents the chance to stay connected and also the chance to children to open up chance to share thoughts and the very fact is that children do feel a uh, much more comfortable in in one to one conversations the other important aspect is celebrating a child's accomplishment however small it is any any simple accomplishment and also sharing his or her disappointments which may be so important to him or her supporting hobbies then again uh, when we discuss this other i think very important aspect is to ensure that children they get a sense of responsibility so be it household responsibility allocating tasks to them to ensure that they feel that they are important contributors to the family maybe helping with small chores like shopping maybe uh, at times if uh, if required you uh, know uh, helping in other household chores etc also really important that at times there has to be some some kind of family rules agreed on rules and children also understand that okay these are these are our limits and these are the consequences for breaking this rule at times children do have a habit of testing limits but i think it's really important that not only there should be a set of rules agreed on rules which which you all agree to would be good for them but they also understand the purpose as to why these are in existence maybe with regard to that the time by which they need to come home uh, limits in terms of uh, you know number of number of hours that they can watch tv or access the internet and other aspect of course is uh, giving them uh, that extra support whenever needed so i think uh, the very fact is that these years we would all agree are are very special years and undoubtedly the feeling of happiness the fact that children can 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 laugh enjoy themselves without worrying about uh, uh, challenges at hand i think that's the best part of it so what is very really important for 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 parents and educators is to handle them through these years so i think as a society we have a more collective responsibility to build systems and support to promote positive development in this phase at times when we read about so many negative incidents of uh, where children have harmed themselves because of various issues etc i think it's very depressing and when we read about such incidents we feel that as a society we have failed somehow so i think i think as as members of civil society it is important for each stakeholder to come forward and handle this more sensitively more maturely so i think these are a few things that i wanted to share uh, we have a we have a very wonderful panel and i'm sure they are going to share their words of wisdom and and wonderful uh, real life experiences with with all of you i thank all of you again for giving me a patient hearing as far as since i was traveling i had to pre record this session i uh, honestly i really wanted to do this live so look forward to see you in our next session again so over to you over to you shwait well ladies and gentlemen that was ochin bhattacharya our founder and ceo uh as you know he is traveling uh, because of personal emergency but that is the importance that we afford to together for education week after week putting these panels together has been our greatest joy greatest learning about the multiple facets of our school education system before we start with the panel discussion a little bit about us here at notebook we at notebook are an edtech platform we create short videos that pertain to the school curriculum going right from class 1 all the way up to class 12 now these videos come in handy to teachers in two separate occasions one is when you as a teacher are starting a new topic in class you could play one of our videos as a visual introduction to the topic these videos are typically 6 to 10 minutes in duration and they offer the students a great way of being able to visualize what is being taught the second is in revision when students are at home and they are trying to revise a topic before a test an exam or even just to get more clarity they have access to the same videos on their personal devices be it a smartphone or a laptop or any other connected device they can access these videos as many times as they want 
Well, these videos offer them a great way to not only remember what was taught in class that day, but also get a firmer grasp of the topic. I will now play a short segment of some notebook videos for you, and then we shall start with our panel discussion. नोटबुक में आप सभी का स्वागत है आज हम गिल्लू नामक रेखा चित्र पढ़ने वाले हैं जिसकी रचना महादेवी वर्मा जी ने की है प्रस्तुत रेखा चित्र में महादेवी वर्मा जी ने एक गिलहरी का वर्णन किया है जो उन्हें अत्यंत दयनीय अवस्था में मिलता है वे अपनी सेवा से उसके प्राण बचाती हैं और उसका आश्रय अपने कमरे में ही बना देती है लेखिका उसे प्यार से गिल्लू बुलाती है swim together in big groups such groups are called schools of fish some fishes drink up more water to look swollen up and big so that they can scare the big fishes perspective means point of view imagine you are standing in a showroom looking at a brand new car on the carousel as the carousel rotates you can see different parts of the car at different times the same thing happens when you see a stationary object like a house you can first see the front of the house as you walk by your point of view changes and you can see the side of the house oh dude look at the bottle i told you something is wrong with this place it doesn't seem right it's probably the sun we might be hallucinating what sun it's cloudy man plus we both can't be hallucinating the same thing let's get back to the coast oh my god i think i saw something and i think i saw you toss plastic into the water why is this so unbelievable don't you see the plastic floating around and you should try swimming in this water wait i will show you how it feels to be stuck with plastic rope under water Well, that was just some segments from some of our notebook videos. If you head over to our website www.notebook.school or use our mobile apps for iOS and Android, you would find more than ten thousand such videos at your disposal. Well, with that done, it is now time to introduce our esteemed panelists, who have been so kind to give us their time for the session today. We have with us Mr. Venkata Chalam Bias, who is the principal of the Narayana Educational Group in Bangalore. He has over 15 years of extensive experience in the field of teaching as well as 6 years in administration as a senior secondary principal. About teaching, sir says that as it is the noblest profession amongst any other, he always enthuses the students with innovative teaching methodology by quoting relevant references and practical happenings in day-to-day -day life. He himself finished his graduation from Sri Venkateshwara University in Tirupati doing his BSc in chemistry, botany and zoology. He then went on to do his MSc in chemistry from Madurai Kamraj University, Madurai. He also has a B.Ed in chemistry from Sri Sharda B.Ed College, Bangalore University. So, thank you so much for sparing your time to be here today. It's a privilege to have you. We also have with us Ms. Divya Bhardwaj, who has 20 years of teaching and administrative experience in prominent army public schools in Dehradun. She finished her education from Delhi, getting a master's in English literature and political science. she is presently the principal at RAN public school in rudrapur ma'am thank you so much for making the time we look forward to hearing your thoughts thank your you so thank you ma'am we also have with us today mr alam ratna reddy who is the principal of the discovery oaks international school cbsc and icsc in hyderabad sir holds an ba in psychology a ba arts from kakatiya university warangal a ba in english and social and an MA in English. He has teaching experience spanning across 25 years. Sir has won numerous awards, to name just a couple, the Paryavaran Dronacharya Award from the Indian Center for Wildlife and Environmental Studies in South Asia region, and the Adarsh Pradhanupadhyay from Mahatma Gandhi Rashtra Bhasha Hind Prachar Samstha. Sir, thank you so much for being here today. It's a privilege to have you. I shall now stop my screen share and uh, switch on my camera. we would request all the panelists to please do the same 
once again a very good evening and a warm welcome to the session today vinkatacharan sir if you could please switch on your camera as well thank you hi sir good evening uh, all the panel members uh, very great to be here in the fata uh, notebook good evening sir privilege having you here as well yeah yeah a few points i would like to mention like uh, the stage where they'll be learning yeah the formative ages or years where the child will be learning many things not only uh, the surrounding or parents or uh, brothers even their uh, uh, nearby also when the child comes to the school he will be learning many things uh, right from the age 3.5 to uh, 8 so it's not only like uh, uh, the child will be learning abc's shapes or uh, basic maths concepts also the child will develop the cognitive uh, motors development because in this age and we could say that let the child learn by his own by making the mistake from the mistakes let the child learn and it will be helpful for his uh, physical as well as the mental attitude okay that's all sir thank you sir it's thank you sir thank you so much for those opening lines i think that really sets the stage very well for me you save me the trouble of having to create opening statements uh, divya ma'am if i may come to you first when we talk about the formative years right there's a certain amount of hand holding that is required and during this time you as a teacher what are the top things the most important aspects that you want this child to learn well i am of the opinion uh, good evening everybody uh my co panelists as well i did join a little late and i'm really sorry for that since it was a connection error uh now coming to the question that you have put up uh formative years happen in my opinion happen to be the most important years because i personally feel a personality of a person is the best to develop during these years it is rightly said that these years shape up the person that the person goes on to become in the later years of their life now and during these times as a teacher it becomes one supreme responsibility of the teacher to mold the child into the personality which is like likable to people and as i say it is full of social help i personally talk a lot about social help why because we have talked a lot about physical we have talked a lot about mental but social health is something which is like uh, here to stay because our existence in the society depends more on the social health formative years happen to be those years where the child's social personality the personality of a person is developed as a teacher it is it does require a little bit of you know hand holding in fact not a little bit quite a good amount of little uh, you know uh, hand holding on the part of the teacher why because this is one time where the child learns how to think creatively this is one time when the child instead of being told what is a slanting line or shapes has to be given something in hand give them a visual delight more than something which they are doing in their copies to you know feel to understand the touch of it which is more important than what is being taught the people to students on the board so yes the part of hand holding comes in the part that how creatively do you make them understand a child in the formative years is not one person who is sitting in your class with a mindset that i have to go out and crack iit no so that means any motivation to study or to understand or to learn something has to be imbibed in the child by the teacher itself so you have to make your classes that creative that the child you are able to hold the interest of the child in the learning so that part of hand holding more creative more innovation is what is required so that the class becomes a delight for the child wonderful ma'am thank you thank you so much for that i particularly like when you said it has to be a likable personality growing up right and that is something that we so often forget uh 
Mr. Reddy, if I may come to you, sir. Uh, we heard how, right? If I may focus on the what for a minute. So what are those skills? What are those initial skills or the initial things to put it more broadly that you would want the child to pick up? Uh, good evening to all the panelists and all the uh, audience who are listening. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, it is very important. The formative period, even life skills takes a, a major role. Now the days are gone. Usually now earlier, the traditional mode of education, we were focusing on marks, ranks and grades and all that. Now those are the days which are gone now. Now current education, either in formative or middle school or primary, pre-primary, wherever it is. Now the education is not going on content-based, but it is going to be skill-based. So definitely content is not that important. In the formative periods, we are going to test the skills of the child are given top priority. So the skills I call it as for language formation, LSRW skills, that is very, very important. Formation period. Now we people try to teach a language. So we go with mainly first LSRW skills, I call it listening. So in the formative period, the skills for listening, more opportunities should be given for the child to listen more. Listening skill is very important. Now we all learn our mother tongue and our language. We keep on listening. This listening. Uh, why? I mean, when our parents speak, or mother, father, grandparents do speak, so we continuously listen. So any language developed or formed in the younger children by listening. Then we have speaking. Whatever they try to listen, they try to embed in their mind. And they start speaking and they try to use that same vocabulary or same language. Then after that, they try to read and they try to write it. So here I wanted to say is we are out of the traditional mode of education. So I prefer that the skills, life skills are more important. Now, that is the reason why even ECCE, uh, now NEP, National Education Policy, has brought a change in the curriculum. And they're saying that holistic skill education. That is the reason now you can't separate skill and the content separately. Now it is one and the same. So skills are also most important. And what are the benefits of this skill in the giving for formative periods? See here, the child is getting multiple opportunities when a child is learning. So he will become, with the skills, he will be becoming more creative and he will be more imaginative. So here the education means we are giving opportunity to the child to think. He has to imagine, he has to frame. So here by skills, the child is learning. No, he is trying to create, be creative. And he's trying to no, imagine by himself. And the skills also make the child to prepare for the real world. Now the content in the textbook or in the learning in the classroom, it has to be applicable in the real world. So skills always connect that learning into the real world. After all, the child is going to live in the society and is going to live in the world. So that's how the skill is important and it will be helping the child to face or withstand the real world. And also the skills are going to help to find the true passion. Now, if you're going only with one skill, the child may get bored and all that. When multiple opportunities are given, definitely the child will be searching for his passion, wherever, whatever his interest is. That's how now international schools also starting, even like a pre-primary or kindergarten, they are going with international. Children need to be exposed to the skills which are available and he or she needs to be ready there. So that's how skills will definitely help the child to find out his true passions and the society he will be also taking through his passion at the young age. And also the skills are going to help the child to know his strengths and weakness. If you are only going with content based, the child may not get opportunity to learn and to find out his strengths and weakness. So definitely multiple skills when the child is exposed to different activities, especially the play. We always say play, play, hands-on experience. But what does the play make the child? The play makes the child to start thinking. 
and he will be coordinating hand on mind activity so he will be also knowing his strengths and weaknesses when a person is learning skills so skills always help the child to know the strengths and weakness not only the child even the teacher even the parent also will be trying to know the strengths or the capacities or the weaknesses or the areas where to improve you see the children are different type of learners audio learners visual learners and kinesthetic learners so you need to find out which learner he or she is so you need to address the skills where it is lacking or where he is uh, no like uh, having pitfalls so skills are playing a vital role in order to you know strengthen his weakness parents will strengthen and also the teacher is going to help them and also the skill learning will help the, the child to think deeper skills will make the child to think deeper and also the child will be trying to learn solving his problems so i feel even in the formative period let the child get exposed to multiple areas where an opportunity is given to knock out or trigger his passion wherever he or she is interested so more than content i believe that skills are more important even when you come up in a professional now skills you no know, usually transform as in, uh, a beautiful transformation from student to professionalist so skills are given the top most important and formative period definitely skill life skills or holistic skills have to be taught for me according to me not the grades not the numbers not the alphabets that is important but if you ask me how are you i'm really sorry sir you have to unmute yourself i think you went on mute development in the formative periods right sir thank you thank you so much for those points uh, i think sir i'll take a point from your book the life skills point and come to venkata chalam sir uh, sir uh, reddy sir spoke about life skills right uh, now when we were growing up personally in school my earliest memory is joining dots to form the english alphabet uh, literacy and numeracy were the big ones when we were growing up it has changed right now divya ma'am spoke about how creative you can be how you can inspire the child to be creative so what has the shift been like in terms of being a teacher yeah uh, thank you sir uh, i understood the question uh, actually when we give the play way method of learning because children know they'll be playing at this age the elementary stage that is age 1 to 8 years so when they'll be uh, playing they'll learn many things even that is why we, uh, our system education system also introduce the play way method of learning so that is enough i think for them to learn the things in the better manner on the easy manner right sir but in terms of teaching life skills what would be some of the things that other teachers could do sorry sir uh, can you get i was saying that in terms of teaching life skills yeah right yeah uh life skills are not things that you would find in the book right uh, yes. so we have a lot of young teachers who join these sessions what could be some things that they do yes yes first they have to observe the things sir what's happening and when they observe no definitely they could learn the things by observing all these life life skills like uh, uh, classroom situation all these they'll be learned wonderful thank you sir i think uh, observation could be one big takeaway uh, divya ma'am if i may come to you once again ma'am uh, in terms of the value based education right this is also something that has been a buzzword uh, in the last few years and you're talking about young impressionable kids so this is the time where you are kind of building their value system up ma'am how do you address that how do you do that well i think uh, if you look from a larger perspective uh uh we are looking at an approach which is more towards an holistic you know pattern of education now when we are talking about a holistic pattern of education i am looking forward to a child who is not only maybe academically not much brilliant but is have holding on to the values which are much required in life now i always tell though i go in the senior classes and i teach english in the senior classes and i tell over there that your 
degree will get you your first job but your excellence and your survival and your success in your job will come only with your skills and your value system so yes value system your yeah, value based things may sound like a buzzword today but it is much in need of the r why because a brilliant student with a destructive mind is something which the society does not want we want a set of people who have have a value they value the citizenship of this country they value the systems of this country yeah maybe not even the country the family actually so anybody who is like a very high achiever and does not have the right value system in terms of a family in terms of a society in terms of your nation is not one person we need in the society so yes value based when we come to the value based system of learning i think our education pattern much or less is keeping value with why i am saying so is because hamari har kahani ka ant mein ek moral zarur hota hai every story at the end of it has a moral to give that moral is the value fine hamari koi kahani aisi nahi hoti hai jiske andar hum ant mein sahi ko jitate nahi hai aur we don't tell the, the wrong one to be the loser this is one part of our system and that is our value based system now values why are they important we all know about it again as i said not a big achiever but a good value system is what is required yes what the teachers need to do is imbibe in children the values which are expected from the society bring it down into their mannerisms bring it down into their way of education and try to tell them this is one thing which is the most proper thing to do in terms of value education it is a buzzword because it is the need of the hour we know we did not start celebrating earth day till we understood that we have done enough bad to mother, mother earth so yes our value system has deteriorated by the years by the what do you call decades down we know what we used to have as a value system is not the same further adding to the point corona has actually shown us not a very good picture of parents not being very supportive in terms of many things i mean there uh, there's a panel of principals sitting here they know how they all of us have struggled with the fee structures like that so i'll not take that up actually but yes i would say that the values imbibed by the teacher has to be in the system of the school which means when we are imparting education to our kids they must understand even when two children are sitting in a class and sharing a toy we have imparted by one way a value to them of sharing a value so these small small activities ya ye ye kahiye ki these small small things in the class actually impart a value to the child and that value really makes a person the person a society needs so i i i still feel the topmost child in academics in seclusion is not what the society needs they would want some 5 year 10 year 50 average children but then living peacefully in a society with a value system where they know how to share things where they know how to help each other where they know when at the time of crisis you have to stand by each other be also mindful of the words that are spoken in presence of each other we do have freedom of speech but we do not have the freedom of hurting each other so i always tell my teachers as well as my students in the class be mindful of the words you use because you are a social animal your words should not by any means harm the serenity of a person so yes values are very important they are to be import, imparted to the students and every activity which can be done in the class one or the other imparts a very good value to the child we should do it more frequently let the child think innovatively creatively and bring a system in the class where good values are taught to the children thank you thank you so much ma'am i think uh, caring compassion mutual respect mindful communication i think beautiful values that if you can imbibe in every child uh, mr reddy sir i'll come back to you uh, so you have more than 25 years in education so 
we will deviate from the theory a little bit and come down to ground realities. We are talking about the formative years, right? Zero to eight. Now, in terms of the child's development, it's not a monolith. Zero to two and a half to three, the child is at home. There is no school in the picture. The house uh, environment, the house values are the perhaps the values that the child is picking up. Now, two to let's say five, they are typically going to a preschool. And let's face it, one of the primary motivations of a preschool is how do you get admitted into good uh, schools for their you know primary, secondary, and uh, senior secondary education. So there, again, values tend to take a bit of a backseat and you're down to again, numeracy and literacy. It's when they enter, let's say a pre-primary or a class one in a longer format school where they spend a good 13 to uh, 12 to 13 years is that is when this entire system kicks in. So how much of unlearning do you need to do in those early classes then? Uh, yes, uh, you're right. Uh, till now today parent is trying to select a school or international school maybe by their amenities or by their infrastructure or a huge building. So parents feel that it is prestigious to join their kids grade one or pre-primary in a big, big schools where... Sir, I'm sorry, you have to unmute yourself. Education, like, you know, body, mind, soul. Yes, there are certain schools which are only confined to the, like, you know, mind, so that they will be going only with academics. And some schools are going with, like, a body that physical education also is very important. Even national education policy is trying to say that no physical education is mandatory, right? And the soul, the values which they are. Really, in, 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 to be frank, uh, maybe the schools are not really focusing on the value education or the, the values or ethical values and social values because they are not judged. Uh, there is no proper criteria where people can assess that, yes, this is the, now the child has learned these values and this girl has learned these values. There are no parameters and there is no scaling and there is no assessment. So, because other, as you said, numeracy and you know, literacy is no like uh, no assessed and scaled and gauged. But whereas here there is no assessment, maybe that is the reason why maybe schools are not implementing a proper value or ethical system in the school education. Secondly, maybe it starts with the family, maybe mother and father. I believe that you no know, values will begin from the uh, house because they are more exposed to to the lot of scenarios uh, in the house rather than in the school. School, you will have a monotonous, uh, uh, like a routine type of activities will go on where the child will be getting less opportunity to learn values. As ma'am said that, yes, sharing, caring, also no understanding, not using abusive, unparliamentary language, all good. But I feel that mother and father behavior, maybe when the neighbors comes, they try to spend a lot of time over the mobile or TV and they say the children not to do that. And they, they are there in the house and they answer that I am not in the house, I am driving. So there are many occasions where parents are giving wrong signals. So how it is possible that uh, parents are going to give uh, no values to the children. So I strongly believe that mother and father are the primary people to inculcate the values uh, among the children, pre-primary because Whatever mother and father says, they try to imitate. The first contact is mother and father. So whatever they do, uh, no, automatically they are getting embedded in the mind. But parents are not aware that I am really polluting my child with my behavior, with my words. So at this juncture, I strongly feel that mother and father or the family is the first and fundamental thing. Then only comes the school where the you know like teacher is second contact uh, person where maybe she is trying to uh, you know like inculcate certain values. So I strongly believe parents are the first people to inculcate ethical values, and I request the parents also to look into the school not by infrastructure, not by the high fee structure, whether the child is coming out with the holistic uh, you know like education like body, mind, and soul. So where these three to be equally focused, then only I think a real value education or holistic education is imparted. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for that. 
Pingarachalam sir, if I may come back to you, this is my final round. Yes. We are talking about a young child, right? Someone between zero to eight years of age. Let's say in school, you are talking to the child from a, let's say an age of three, four or five. Now there are two parts to this child. There are some innate traits that are skills, that are abilities, that are special gifts that the child comes to the school with. Yes. Yes. And then there are values and skills and other things that the school is trying to impart. So where do you balance between how much you control and how much you let the child just develop on their own? Exactly, sir. Uh, as the sir was telling, Alan Prasna, uh, uh, child will be learning values from the parents. And uh, rightly, sir said that we should not look into the school, uh, the building, or even the key sector, or the infrastructure based on that. We should not judge a school. So when we can judge a school based on the, the values that the child learns in this age. Zero to eight years. As you are asking about that, so this uh, social skills. Right? I did not get into the person. Sorry, sir. I didn't get that last line. Yeah, please, please. Can you repeat the person? Sir, I was asking between controlling what the child is doing and letting the child grow on their own trajectory. It's a balance, right? It's a fine balance. How do you ensure that balance? Yes, yes. So first, as a teacher or the school, first we have to identify what the inherited talent that the child has. The child has some uh, gifted talents where it comes automatically by they'll be learning from the people or from the parents or neighbors. And also the school also will be focusing on certain uh, skills to learn by the child. Example, if you say the child is very good at uh, singing or the dancing or the, uh, making the music, all this the child may be good. But the school will be providing certain kind of activities to the child. But when we identify in the school, when we identify certain gifted uh, qualities of the child, as we have to increase those qualities, as we have to increase whatever the uh, skills that the school is uh, putting on the child, that also should be balanced in the right manner. Wonderful, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Divya ma'am, if I come to you uh, with the same question, basically, but exactly how exactly also do you strike this balance? Well, I believe that every child, uh, as an important part of the child system, will have one or the other quality or one or the other thing which is special to that child. It can never happen that every speciality will end up in one child only. Yeah, again, uh, one thing we have to break the stereotype which says that which brands the children as a high achiever and a low achiever. Fine. Uh, normally, it's a general practice, which I think nowadays it has changed a lot. That there was a time when it was said that these are the high achievers of my class. And here I'm talking about academics. High achievers of my school, so they are the likable of my class and they are the ones who are my favorite and the other ones who are not getting good marks yeah maybe the teacher is struggling more with the child to get something done in the copy now here again i'm talking about that part of academics you are struggling to make the child right but i do understand it very clearly that a person a, a child who is very high academic achievement you may struggle may struggle to make the child sink Whereas a child who is not doing academically very well, you may not struggle with the child. Point here, if you ask a monkey to climb up the tree, he'll be the first one to do it. But then the same work, if you do it to the elephant, he'll not be able to do it. But you can't brand the elephant as a child who is not achieving anything. Again, as an inborn uh, quality, every child will have his or her own quality, his or her own skills. So the quality, the best quality of even a parent or even a teacher is to ide identify that one quality and then work upon it. I cannot, again, if a child is a good singer, he has an inclination towards music, 
Thank you so much, ma'am. You took me back to a very old adage uh, from one of our previous sessions where somebody said, "Thank goodness nobody tried teaching uh, Sachin Tendulkar how to be fantastic at physics." Ah, uh, uh, yeah, but we in India we are fond of uh, teaching people. So at times even Sachin Tendulkar has been given advices. Is bat ko is ball ko ap aise maarte to out na hote. So again, we can't say that. But yes, as a teacher, it is my job to identify. what is the best in the child if i am able to identify the balance will it in itself come in the right place wonderful ma'am uh, ready sir i'll come to the other end of the question for you where uh, let's say you are talking to a child in his or her formative years and you identify there's a learning difficulty uh, there are children with special needs and as a system we have become more mindful of their presence sir at what age do you think these are well identified and maybe you can get a counselor to intervene uh yes sir the, that's right um, yes we can't Im- immediately identify the learning or dis- disorder or uh, no dyslexia so we can't immediately identify there are of two three types uh, one is of behavioral uh, psychology another one is memory part of it and maybe the third is the physical part of it uh, definitely uh, parents must be identifying the no physical deformity or physical disorder where they can immediately go to the doctor and they can identify that but definitely uh, like a, a learning disorder definitely they need to get uh, not the, at the early age i don't think so uh, we can't really identify the learning disorders among the children uh, maybe it has to go maybe little age has to come uh, maybe after 8 years or 9 years or 10 years they may be able to identify that uh, learning disorders maybe a psychologist or a special educator can definitely you know help them out but i find even as a principal and uh, of different schools i do face uh, this type of problems when they come to me first of all i try to you not know, like listen to them and try to analyze uh, their words and their statements accordingly then i am i am not expert in that particular area but definitely i'll be trying to suggest a right person to diagnose that and to give a solution yes children due to this pandemic you know lot of uh, uh, disorder in their behavior and you know in their thinking pattern yes a lot of change has occurred and because they were confined to four walls almost for two years now my children in uh, now uh, ik2 like i can i can call this ukg they are coming to school first time two years of no schooling online schooling how it helped and all nobody knows that and you know the child deserves certain things of his age and i feel that wonderful life they have missed it like nursery and you know lkg kid really they have lost their beautiful childhood because of that some ailments are there but i strongly believe that no child is like a book 
born with a disability but definitely everything can be addressed now that is the reason why uh, government of india is encouraging that inclusive education every school need to provide accommodation and facility for the child to learn like an ordinary child so he or she should get equal benefit no school has the right to you no know, like a disagree the admission or not giving admission so they have all rights reserved they can send their children whatever the lapses they have definitely they can get a good education but definitely it is not the primary ages where we identify there are certain minor elements that can be rectified uh, through a proper uh, guidelines and proper uh, persons can solve those problems it's not a major defect wonderful sir thank you thank you so much for that thank you to all three of you i think it's been a fantastic learning journey for me personally uh, just to look at how educators experienced educators look at the formative years of young children it is now time for me to do a quick recap and uh, say my thank yous uh, to all three panelists thank you thank you so much for sparing your time i know this could not have been easy this time of the year and uh, thank you so much for sparing your time and sharing so much of your knowledge and expertise with us uh, bharat sir thank you so much for the Bye, beautiful slide start yes ma'am my pleasure ma'am the privilege is entirely ours uh, and uh, we have learned so so much right so we know that the importance of value education we are talking about sharing caring being mutually respectful of using language that is not hurtful to others we spoke about how you treat children with innate special abilities uh, you spoke about how you kind of let the children be and kind of find their own voice find their own speciality and then nurturing them from there uh to all three of you we are in your debt for this wonderful wonderful session uh we look forward to meeting all of you again in the audience uh we hope to see you again next week until then please take care stay safe and goodbye thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you so much, much.